you for the invitation. And besides being the uh, managing director of CKO, uh, Center for Cultural and Experience Economy, I also have the pleasure of being on the board of the Danish Cultural Institute. Great pleasure. And I have, for the last uh, five years, collaborated with the Swedish Institute. Uh, they have a fantastic uh, event in Sweden called Almedalsveckan. Uh, on Gotland the first week of July, where I've been the last five years and had great opportunity to meet uh, many in the cultural field and also in other areas of Swedish uh, uh, civil uh, service and life. Uh, my presentation will be about uh, the cultural and creative industries and diplomacy. And um, as you can already see here on my first presentation, I'm uh, trying to uh, challenge you in what is culture and what is creative industries, and I will it's my opinion that there is no difference, really. I know there are some people that would like to say that culture is everything that taxpayers have to pay for, and creative industries is anything that's commercial, but it's not like that at all. There are many uh, things we see in the field of culture and creative industries that maybe start out as something that's supported by an arts council and end up being in a company employing 5,000 people like Cirque du Soleil is the case. Ten years of arts council support and then now uh, billion uh, Canadian dollar company. So in many ways there's not necessarily this contradiction between the two and next Wednesday I will be, actually this Wednesday I will be at the State Department in Washington DC where we will talk about how to use creative industries and also entrepreneurship in actually enhancing some of the State Department's goals in foreign policy because of course the more entrepreneurs we have around the world uh, maybe we will have a better world, that's what the, the theory is. There are three Nordic approaches to the creative industries, the cultural and creative industries. The first one is called the Richard Florida version, which is how can we attract people? How can we maybe win the Eurovision Song Contest and bring people here or have uh, MTV Music Awards or build a Guggenheim in Bilbao this way? How can we somehow attract uh, talent uh, to work for us? Uh, how can we attract the right companies? How can we attract tourists? And ultimately, how can we get people to stay here? So that's the first, this regional or even a national approach of branding a, a city or a country or a region. The second one is a growth industry approach, where we say we have certain industries uh, in our economy that are growth industries. And they are actually the creative industries. They are not necessarily, they're not uh, nice to have. They're a need to have. In Denmark, they're about 12% of the value added of the economy, and that's quite a lot. So we're talking gaming, fashion, publishing, uh, um, uh, movies, music, uh, and maybe also food industry. Because I'm sure if you go to Noma, I haven't been to Noma yet, but I've been, I will go there soon. Uh, it's not because you're hungry. It's not because of the fun function of hunger. It's because you want to be entertained, and you will be entertained the whole evening. Uh, it's about something else that goes on when you go there. The last one is about uh, uh, how can the creative industries create value in the rest of the economy? How they, can they contribute to growth in the rest of the, the last 90%? And that is as basic as any time a company realizes they need a new logo and they don't have the in-house competences to develop this uh, visual communication platform. They call for someone with these creative competences in visual design and then help them do it. But it's more than that as well. It's also how do you design the whole way a company or, or a, a country or a city is experienced. How is it, how is it perceived? Can you somehow use all the senses uh, in trying to uh, uh, get hold of people and, and get them into uh, your fold? And I'll give you an example, a concrete example at the end of my presentation where you'll all experience this. Also, I want to tell you we made several uh, works, especially in Denmark, but also in the European Union. I have this chairmanship uh, that the DG Enterprise appointed me to called the European Creative Industries Alliance, and it turns out that the creative industries are much more homogeneous as a sector, uh, despite the sector wants to say something else. I know the people working with fashion want to say they have very little in common with music, although most fashion shows have music. I'm sure you can rectify that. But, but in general, the, the sector doesn't see itself as one sector, not like the clean tech sector or the transportation sector. But it is actually. They have much more a homogeneous profile of challenges, of, of policy needs, etc. So in many ways, there is a sector. And this myth that the cultural and creative industries do not want to earn any money or do not want to make any difference is, um, is a myth. 
they do want to get sold, they want to be experienced, uh, uh, consumed, whether it's a book that wants to be read or a piece of music that wants to be listened to. So that, that they're doing it for art's sake uh, is uh, not something we could confirm. When we asked 1,400 uh, creative people in Denmark and compared them to 600 non-creative people, they are a sector and they are actually also out in there for the money. What, how does this pertain to the subject today? Well, I'll give you several examples, but one is that the cultural and creative industries are much more internationally oriented than the rest of the economy. They have a much, uh, they are born, born international, you could say, in many ways. A fashion company from Denmark, and there are quite a few, uh, if they would only focus on the Danish market, and luckily they don't, uh, they would be very small. Some of the biggest companies in Denmark are actually from um, the fashion industry and, and contribute the most. I think it's the second or the third largest, fourth largest uh, export is actually the fashion industry in, in, in Denmark. So they're much more internationally oriented, but they also have a high, the value that they add is in IPR, is in intangible uh, uh, assets. These intangible assets that often can be digitalized and copied and not paid for, uh, if you go to certain countries, uh, I once did some consultancy for the, uh, for the Vietnamese uh, cultural uh, ministry that uh, wanted to put quotas on movies uh, because they wanted more uh, Vietnamese to continue watching uh, Vietnamese movies. And I said, well, why don't you just go down to the street and you can go in and buy any kind of movie you want. Uh, even you can go in and say you're from Denmark and then you be, can be handed the latest TV series, uh, of course, bootleg uh, from any company. So, so it, IPR is a crucial thing, protecting it and exploiting it. And then also getting out their business development and access to finance, but this is more in the periphery. This uh, presentation uh, I came up with was about, is about policies and practices. So uh, what do we do in, when it comes to policies, when it comes to creative, uh, culture and creative industries? And I can speak on a Nordic level, we've had an initiative called uh, CREA Nord that will be ending this year but will be replaced hopefully or most likely by another project where we have the Ministry of Subculture and the Ministries of, of uh, Economics and Growth collaborate on, on how to get the most out of the creative, Euro creative, uh, the creative uh, industries in the Nordic region. And a lot of it has been actually export uh, activities, common uh, internationalization efforts. In Europe, the approach has been uh, much more the, the cross-sector innovation part, this how can these industries contribute to an industrial renaissance, as it's, it's called, an industrial renaissance of Europe. How can we move from the old industries into new, smart, sustainable growth through the creative industries, thanks to the creative industries? And one important factor is also, of course, internationalization and this European market for uh, for uh, culture and creative industries, both in many practical terms. How can a Danish concert organizer also organize concerts in Spain if he's better at it than Spanish uh, uh, concert promoters? And also on a more wider scale, how can we use it when we go international in, in, uh, in delegations, etc.? So C European Creative Industries Alliance that I'm chairman for until the end of the year will present its, uh, pres its, its conclusions there. It's, a bit too technical to get into here. There are 10, uh, ten uh, recommendations that take about an hour to explain. Uh, but uh, if you want, if you're interested in this field, come to Amsterdam on the 27th and 28th of November, end of this year. And it's about cross-sector innovation. It's about creating ecosystems that can promote internationalization. And then also, how can we make these industries speak with one voice? That was the policy side, very, very quickly. I, uh, and, and, and superficially. The practice side, I want to give a case that actually is working extremely well. It's called Creative Business Cup. It's something I founded in 2010 here in Denmark and uh, went international in 2012. It is actually an entrepreneurship competition, or it is more than that. It is a way for countries to put entrepreneurship in the culture and creative industries on the agenda. And right now, as we speak, 64 countries around the world are actually holding Creative Business Cup uh, competitions, finding the best startups that can then come to Copenhagen in November and compete to win the cup. But more than that, also to 
meet investors and to be part of workshops and seminars. This is an extremely easy and, or easy, it's an extremely uh, efficient way of doing cultural diplomacy or uh, branding of Denmark as a creative nation. So around 64 countries right now, they are saying we should all go to the most creative nation in, in, in the world and learn more about how to promote entrepreneurship and uh, they are all uh, coming and hopefully we'll have a great time. How do we do it? And I think that's one of the great points of doing um, cultural diplomacy is to collaborate with other people. And uh, we have in each country where we, where we uh, are based uh, great collaboration with companies that are either focused exclusively on entrepreneurship or exclusively of, on creative industries or if we're lucky on entrepreneurship and creative industries, which we do see in some uh, countries, for example, in the United Kingdom, in the UK have had policies around uh, creative industries uh, for the last 15, 20 years, so they're quite developed with uh, such institutions and initiatives as Creative England. A lot of it also is awareness raising. How do we, how do we create uh, awareness both in Denmark, but also especially around in the world? Like how can we get in the Financial Times and tell about Denmark as a creative nation and where it's all happening? So we can have more people move here and start companies and start the next Lego, start the next uh, uh, Georg Jensen or Bestseller or Royal Copenhagen or another uh, gaming company. I promise you I will give you a little test here at the end. And what you see in front of you is uh, Pete Mondrian that hopefully uh, quite a few of you know. And uh, Christian Hornslet that I almost say hopefully very few of you know. No, I wouldn't say that. But uh, uh, Christian Hornslet is a Danish artist. And if you look closely at these two artists and look at these two um, uh, uh, paintings, take a close look and I'll ask you a question. And let's see how quickly your answer comes straight to your mind. My question is very simple. If these were airlines, who would you fly with? And my point is, you're talking about the culture and creative, or the creative industries, and this is soft power, but I think it's actually very much hard power you can start revolutions with songs. I heard, I, I have read that Belgium, and maybe it's a bad example of the state that Belgium is today, started with uh, riots after an opera at La Monnaie. Uh, I, I don't know if it's confirmed, you can confirm it. Uh, so actually, they are very powerful, these cultural and creative industries. And just this five second experiment it went straight into under your skin or in your heart. So in many ways, they can be more powerful, I think, uh, with, uh, than, uh, than many other ways of moving forward. Some people argue that that's why we ended the Cold War, uh, was because of, of, of this. Here at the end, there are, of course, some dangers. The picture you see up here is a picture of a, of a Danish computer game called Limbo that won several prizes uh, four or five years ago. It was on the top of Xbox, etc. And one point is, my first point is, the first support this computer game uh, received was from the Danish Arts Council, from Kulturstyrelsen, because of its artistic qualities. It shows a little boy uh, trying to save his uh, younger sister in a dark, gloomy, humid, moist uh, Scandinavian Nordic forest. And it, it had great artistic qualities and ended up actually also having great commercial qualities. These are not necessarily contradictions at all. But I think uh, the danger is uh, in, these, in these times that we ignore the fact that, uh, that these creative, uh, culture and creative products and services have great influence, have great influence on, on diplomacy. I had the fortune of visiting the Soviet Union in 1988, and uh, what was on everyone's mind when you met them was whether they could buy my jeans uh, it was about fashion uh, that was on uh, the young uh, Soviets that I met at the time, uh, not so much what was going on in Europe. So here at the end, for more information, and thank you for your attention.